not going to bore you with statistics about the instrument, although they are impressive enough. The largest organ in the world until the Albert Hall came along. And then, of course, the Americans built larger ones, but then you would have expected them to, wouldn't you? Um, and also, there are also extraordinary stories about the award of the contact to Mr. Best, who is our first city organist, and indeed, one of my heroes. But what I want to say is, I hope, more important than that. Let us first think about how important the organ as an instrument is in all of our lives. Apart from the fact that it appears at every wedding, every funeral and every christening for a star, just think of the pieces of music that you've heard which, have a dom a dominate, which are dominated by the organ whether it be that mighty chord at the beginning of the last movement of Sanson's organ symphony, or whether it be the Vidor or the Bach Toccatas, which you would all know immediately if you heard the first guess that tune notes. But of course, it's not just classical music. What about that organ in the House of the Rising Sun? Do you remember it? What about the Hammond organ in all those pop records of the 60s? Dylan's Positively Fourth Street is one of my favorite examples. We all don't realise how much and how important it is to us. And as for this building, well, I can say that the organ saved this building. This was supposed to be a concert hall and it became a mighty symbol of the town's development and its desire to become a city. Once that happened, of course, this room was not the concert hall that was originally envisaged. Indeed, for the orchestral musician, it does create some difficulties, like a CD player in a bathroom, if anyone's still got a CD player apart from me. But there's something about the organ which I don't hear mentioned enough. It's extraordinary democratic nature as an instrument. When people came into this room to hear Mr. Best recitals in the 1880s, he could play anything and he took great delight in playing it at a twelfth of the price of the admission price to our concert halls. He used to say jokingly, if I haven't transcribed it, I know somebody who has. Of course, he meant Franz Rist. For every piece you ever heard on Classic FM or Radio 3 or a concert hall, in the 19th century there were transcriptions for either two pianos or organ or both. And so many people, sometimes 3,000 people, came for those Saturday recitals. This organ saved this building because it could triumph over the acoustics. And you've heard it tonight, played wonderfully by Ian, with the gentleness of the piece before the last one. And then he unleashed its mighty power in those last few minutes. That is how it can dominate this room and turn it into a fine and interesting musical venue. In an age now, when music comes out of toilet walls and hotel lifts and everywhere where you don't want it to sometimes, you've got to understand how hard it was for ordinary people in the 19th and early 20th century to hear music. Best only had two rules for admission to his recitals. Don't let him in if they're drunk, he used to say to old Stanley on the door. Don't let him in if they're drunk, he said and make sure all their bits are covered. We don't want to frighten the ladies, he used to say. And he used to do that because he had a revolutionary view. Not in politics, of course, you couldn't find a stauncher Tory. But he had a revolutionary view that ordinary people were entitled to hear music. And I remember, um, because when you can't see things, you, you tend to listen a bit more. And I remember, being up in the gallery one day and one of Ian's students was playing that fine old Beatle tune when I'm 64 on the organ. When I get old. And somebody next to me was tutting about using the organ for a pop for a pop tunes. And I had to tell him that Best was known to play Mary Lloyd and music hall songs on it when he was in here. And was always trying to get different noises out of it. Gadgets and whistles and steam engines and stuff. The organ in its history is like a living thing. There's lots of wood and movable parts 
I know my colleague there talked about the amount of money that would actually be needed. That's because we live in a warmer age. The Victorians were tougher in some ways than we were. Sometimes this building is probably too hot for the moving parts of the organ. It is like, what did they used to say about the fourth bridge? Once you, you, you always have to, as soon as you finish one end, you've got to start painting it again. I don't know, I've never read in any of the published books about St George's Hall how near the organ was to be taken out of this building after the Second World War. It had an extraordinary career. It started off on the most wonderful note. The first recital that were played, was played was to collect money for the wife and child of Mr Elms, our first architect, who died before the building was complete at the age of 33. It continued then into the 20th century with these amazing recitals and the organist who I've studied so often over the years. In the 30s and beyond, there used to be kind of polite football specials that turned up here, sometimes to hear the three organs in one day, the cathedral organs and this one, which I know Ian has done since. But thousands used to come up on a special train for these events. In wartime, the organ was moved downstairs. And in 1941, when the city was under attack in what's known as the May Blitz, they tended to use any available cellars they could to store water when it was available to fight the fires from those cellars. So emergency water supply caused the pipes probably more difficulty than the German Chancellor's bombs. So after the war, in times of great austerity, austerity I should say, I think people forget how hard those first few years after the war were. It was very difficult to make that decision about the organ. We were coming to our 750th year in 1957 and an ex-organist, Herbert, Herbert Ellingford, wrote a very influential letter for me to retirement, for his place of retirement, and the organ was saved in time for a very fine series of recitals in that 1957. The situation for attendance at concert, concerts, which we now take so much for granted, did not alter till after the Second World War, when Stephen Waring played a Rachmaninoff concerto at the first what was known as industrial concert, everything changed. There was an extraordinary incident in wartime in Liverpool where a very famous artist stopped in the middle of a Chopin prelude and said to the audience, why are we sitting in separate seats like this? Why, are we, why do we have denominations of seats like that? Until everybody comes and sits together, I cannot continue to play. And everyone moved into the central space. And I honestly think that that made a great change. An idea which the Arts Council and other organisations brought in, that all people should be entitled to attend these events. And this organ carried that banner at that time when, when people, ordinary people were excluded. Apart from the medicals for the First World War, when some six or seven thousand people were in this building, the number of people that were in this hall for the Max Jaffa organ concert, anybody old enough to remember him? Famous seaside organist. The number of people who attended that, you forget, you forget, don't forget your Beatles, but Max got more than they did. It was so full that even a newspaper of the 1950s suggested that the hall was dangerously full. So it might have been the Merseyside Commonwealth Orchestra. It might have been the Harold Ackroyd Band. It might have been Mr. Best Recitals, or Mr. Pierce, or those of, who followed him. But this organ made a contribution to the music of our city beyond any other single instrument or venue. And in, for that reason, of course, and indeed for many others, it deserves and needs to be supported. The idea of a building like this without an organ like this is beyond any comprehension. It is an extraordinary thing, however, that way back at the beginning of the project, Elms wanted to construct his organ in a particular way so that both of the courtrooms could rise at the same moment at the end of their morning session. 
the second architect Cockles. It was not the concert hall as, it, as originally envisaged. Of course, he constructed the marvellous concert room upstairs, but had the organ put into this room so that it would be able to deal with the musical heritage of the building. This hall I have studied for 25 years, and I have gone beyond the mere repetition of statistics, and have been fascinated by this idea of joining this great hall that we are now, of course, in, to the court at each end, which brings together the complete opposites of the Victorian age. When Liverpool became a city in May of 1880, with a population of 690,000 people, this building and the buildings that came with it, the libraries, the museums and so on, were the kind of buildings on which Liverpool could make the basis of its request for city status. Not just their economic power and prowess, no. It had to be this idea that they had constructed this, what we might now call, cultural quarter. But more importantly, for whatever motive, they had begun to involve themselves in the lives of those thousands and thousands of people who lived here. And this building, despite the difficulties of budget, they are not new, of course. Despite that, despite the cost of it, this was a necessary part of turning Liverpool from a town, which of course had been at the centre of the slave trade, into this great powerful message and symbol which only a capital city might attempt. Of course, I am not saying that this is such a capital city, but it was, by this building, making an extraordinary contribution. The organ is a powerful representative of the right of all people to come into this building and the right of all people to hear music. And the events that we now have in the hall have brought more people into it than in any earlier part of its history. I know my colleagues will um, tell you about the events, and if the food is as good at the dinner as I've just eaten in here, I've never had so much in 25 years of town hall functions, I've got to tell you. If it's as good as that, I might even turn up very gently myself. Can I wish this hall all the best of good fortune? I contemplate retirement and a cat on a daily basis now. But um, I would want to wish this building good fortune and all the events that take place in it. And I know that with Ian and whoever later that the organ is, <coughs> is in good hands. I want to thank you for coming tonight and ask you to support all the projects and endeavours which are a part of this great building. And finally this, the thing that often gets said to me most Apart from, why haven't you got a dog? <laughs> That's what they usually say to me. Is, when people say to me, well, I've not been in there, you know. I've lived here all my life, and I've not, uh, I've not been in there. And I say to them, think of it, I said, like an old relative. Your uncle, I was going to say your uncle Gladys, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you go past and... You see the milk and the paper's been taken off the step and you know the old place is all right. And you, you say one day, you'll get in there. And just think about the good and bad times in our city when this place has drawn people unto itself like a magnet. And I was tumbling into town on the 14th a few weeks ago and we turned left into Lime Street and a little child said to his mum, or her mum, you can't tell when they're young. Hey mum, that's Buckingham Palace over there. And his mum said, no it's not, it's George's Hall. <laughs> Neither of them have been in this building probably. And unless the school brings the child, neither of them may come in. But even if they are not aware of it, it is a part of their culture. And our dear old organ is central to that culture. Thank you very much.